And we're live. We're live, guys. Welcome to another episode of Good Morning Liberty. Happy Halloween to you. Today is Wednesday morning, October 31st, 2018. It's 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. My name is Michael Bolden, broadcasting live from here in my home office and studio for the 10th Amendment Center. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.30 a.m. Uh, at YouTube. And of course, we post these videos later on through many other channels. Primarily, uh, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, it's the uh, blog over at 10thamendmentcenter.com. You could just go to blog.10thamendmentcenter.com. We also share these videos to our other social media channels. Uh, for example, uh, BitChute, Brighteon, Minds.com, and the hated Facebook and Twitter. I also want to try a new one that I saw. The platform looked really good. It's a, a blockchain, a Bitcoin cash-based one called Keyport.tv. I might sign up for that and do that uh, today. We'll see sometime in the near future. I figure we should just start putting stuff out there uh, in as many platforms as possible. I also want to mention that I finally got it done. Well, not totally done, but I've had a number of people ask about this. They wanted to have an audio-only version, podcast style. And uh, they uh, said, hey, you know, we like watching on YouTube, but, you know, I'm at work. I can't really do the video or I'm showing my, shoving my, uh, hiding my, my phone and the battery's dying out, things like that. So I definitely got it into my daily workflow where it's going to be easy peasy for me to do it, convert it to an MP3 at a decent file size. We updated our old school Libsyn podcast hosting service, which is Really, really solid stuff. We've had the, an account there since maybe 2009 or 10 when I started my first podcast a long time ago. Didn't continue it. Really should have. Uh, but uh, it's going to be pretty easy. We're submitted to the Google Play or Google Podcasts plus iTunes so far. We're waiting. It's under review. It's been two days now, so it's a little slower than I would expect. Usually it's just 24 hours or so. Sometimes it's shorter. Uh, but we're under review. The, the feeds are validated. Good to go. And once we get that approved, I'll probably start submitting to Stitcher, maybe TuneIn, maybe even Spotify. We'll see. Uh, but definitely going to do an audio-only podcast. And we'll have links on that on the show notes page every single time once we get approved, unless I run into problems. Uh, hi to EHP Training out in the chat. Asks about Vimeo. You know, I like Vimeo as a platform. And we use Vimeo, at least for the time being, we might use uh, a proprietary version. We use it for our members' website. So if you are going to members.10thamendmentcenter.com and logging in, we pre-post a lot of our weekly videos, the short two- to three-minute ones that we have. Plus, we have, of course, all of our ebooks and things available for all our members to uh, download in PDF, Kindle uh, format uh, for Apple Books as well. Uh, but the videos that we post there, because we can set privacy controls really well over at Vimeo, we host them through Vimeo, and they're available over at members10 amendmentcentercom So I don't know if this type of show is going to be good on Vimeo, but I guess I could try it <laughs> again. Small things grow great by Concord. Concordia Res Parve Chris Cunt is our is our motto. You see that on our membership cards. You find it on our website. It's a phrase written by the penman of the revolution, John Dickinson, who was really opposing uh, a parliament taking action against the parliament of New York or the assembly of New York and saying, hey, at very first step, we should just tell them we don't support this. Don't go blindly. Don't quietly obey. At least say this is bad. And one small step can lead to others. And that's how he signed off this letter from a farmer in Pennsylvania, the first of 12 essays that were very famous at the time. Concordia res parve cris con. Let's at least take the small step. So <laughs> I appreciate you mentioning it, EHP training. Hi to Justin Bayola. I appreciate you tuning in. And for those of you who may not be uh, in the live chat, whether you're watching it live or here in the archives, the best way you can help us spread the word, two things. Smash the like button. Always hit that like button, whether you're here on YouTube or on another channel. And, of course, whether you're on a, another social media uh, service where you find the links to this. And share. When you find it, share it with your friends. Share it through email. Share it widely. Post it. 
Uh, we've been getting more and more numbers, more and more subscribers. And between here and BitChute and Brighteon and elsewhere, we're getting more views. The no view counts are kind of low on YouTube. I neglected this channel for many years, but consistently we're picking up steam. So I appreciate everybody who's been doing that. I appreciate everybody who's been sharing and smashing that uh, like button. Really appreciate it. Helps a lot. I also want to mention that this week, Sunday, if you haven't heard, I will be doing a free event in uh, on the west side of Los Angeles, West Hollywood. I should actually pull up the uh, the link to it. It's a brunch, free brunch hosted by Liberty on the Rocks, Los Angeles, along with Republican Liberty Caucus of uh, L.A. County, which is Nick Hankoff's group. But it's going to be a brunch with me, Jason Stapleton, and of uh, Lions of Liberty, Brian McWilliams. So that should be really fun. We'll also have uh, a bunch of other organizations mostly just going to be hanging out, talking. I will probably give uh, an interesting short speech about something. And then I'd rather do some Q&A because it seems more like the atmosphere to do that. And then next week, Saturday or the following Saturday, I will be in Dallas, Texas with the Abbeville Institute. Uh, their event is called The Revival of Secession and State Nullification. There are tickets available. It's not a cheap one, but there are a lot of really great speakers there, including Jeff Deist, head of the Mises Institute. So that will be really cool. Dallas, Texas on the 10th. I'm going to be talking about the state of the nullification movement, some philosophical underpinnings, where things are going, where things are and where things are going. Uh, I think I had one other. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go to I'm not speaking at it or anything, but I'm probably going to go to an event at uh, the Reason Institute, also on the west side of Los Angeles, a free event Thursday night starting at 7 p.m. I don't have a link for it, but uh, Thaddeus Russell, who's a really great podcaster, he had me on a show a while back. Really cool guy. Splits his time between Oregon here and uh, Oregon and here in Southern California. And Thad is going to be debating somebody probably crushing him because he's awesome. So I'm going to go to that event. I know Jared LaBelle of Libertarian Institute is planning on being there, plus a number of other people in that uh, realm. So if you are in uh, Los Angeles, that's a really cool thing. Go to Reason.com and see what you can find. I'm not sure if they're really promoting it or not, but that should be an interesting, uh, interesting option. Now, today I want to talk about what well, I think with the elections coming next week, a lot of people I hear as we hear every single time this happens is at least people who support the Constitution and liberty. We never hear vote Democrat because the Republicans are going to be worse, but we often hear vote Republican because the Democrats are getting worse and worse and worse. I think Michael Malice, who's a pretty famous podcaster and commentator, author, he often says, you know, uh, Democrats are going to the cliff at 75 miles an hour and Republicans are going at 50. Maybe the numbers are wrong and maybe it's not a cliff. But the analogy is Democrats are going way faster. And uh, for a guy who's an anarchist, I find it interesting. I think he's a really intelligent guy. But I actually disagree with the idea that one team is going slower than the other, especially if we look at I, I would say maybe in some regards they're going slower. But in regards to spending, I think uh, this current administration and the current Congress are showing that Republicans are going as fast, if not faster. Now, maybe Democrats want to go faster, but I think there's an argument to be made that when Democrats are in power, establishment Republicans and Tea Party Republicans actually take a stand because it's very popular to do that. And I have mentioned on this show a number of times Ted Cruz as a great example, because when Obama was in power, Cruz was willing to do a government shutdown over the funding of Obamacare. That is and he got lambasted by all kinds of establishment types. Look, there's no way to actually do this. You don't have the votes. Don't waste your time, etc. And I don't think doing the right thing should really depend upon whether you have enough votes to go with you or not. If you're one person alone and you're the only person willing to do the right thing, why not do the right thing anyways? Because it's the right thing. So at the time, I probably at least lightly praised Ted Cruz for doing the right thing, because you should take a stand for what's right. If you take an oath to the Constitution to preserve, protect, and defend it, it's not, I take an oath, I will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution as long as I have the majority in Congress and a president that will sign whatever I want to do. It's you take an oath to defend it no matter what. So even if you're a lone wolf, 
willing to try to shut down the government, even if you can't do it, but doing some kind of a filibuster, slowing things down, bringing attention to it. Small things grow great by Concord. Again, uh, the message is the same. John Dickinson said a mere non-binding resolution to oppose the English government's, the Crown's attack on the colony of New York, a non-binding resolution that had no effect was extremely important, and other states should do the same. Other colonies at the time should do the same, even though it would have no immediate concrete effect, because it at least creates a rallying cry. If that's all you've got, you go for it. So when Ted Cruz was going to try to, or Ted Cruz took a stand against the funding of Obamacare when, when Obama was in office, that was the right choice. Now that Republicans are in control in... Uh, in Washington, in Congress, and in the executive branch, and in the judiciary. What did Ted Cruz do when Obamacare funding came up? He voted for it because he's getting challenged from the left. So he doesn't, again, this is an example of how these people really don't have principles. They're extremely dangerous. And voting for them because they use some rhetoric when it's easy to do so is uh, is not really a great strategy. So those of you who I know, and I'm not telling anyone to not vote, but I haven't found an example of how getting Republicans in power in Washington, D.C. has done anything to limit the power of government. And I can actually make the case, and maybe someone can argue better than me, I can make the case that when Republicans are in power, even if maybe they want to go 50 miles an hour towards the cliff and Democrats want to go 75, because there is no one hitting the brakes, they're actually going 100. So they end up going even faster in many cases than the Democrats do, because the Republicans, when Democrats are in power, when Obama was there, you had many uh, of these Tea Party Republicans, even some of the establishment ones, you know, throwing a wrench in the system, opposing it, creating a rallying cry, creating opposition. But now when it comes to spending... There is no opposition. Well, very, very little and not vocal at all. When Ted Cruz voted to fund Obamacare, this is a great example of how that plays out. Uh, hi to Matthew Butts. Oh, cool. I had a blast at Liberty on the Rocks with Scott Horton. Great people coming together for Liberty. I just, I never just instantly made friends out of complete strangers. And that to me, so <laughs> that is really cool. Hey, Matthew, I appreciate you being here in the chat. Hopefully... Hopefully, if you can... Oh, you're back home in Kentucky. Well, if you can make it around next time, they're going to keep doing these events. Uh, Pablo, who has been doing these Liberty on the Rock events here in Southern California, have been doing it for years. I spoke at one of them back in maybe 2013, 2014, so years ago. He's been hosting events for a long time. And Pablo's goal with these, and I may have mentioned this before talking about this, his goal is... You know, it's important for people to actually develop a social life where you have some like-minded people to hang out with. So that's really cool to Matt, of Matt to say uh, that. Uh, and you, I think, Matt, I remember you had driven quite a way when you were here in California, too. So it was really cool, Matthew, that you came down to hang out with us. So it's really important for us to develop these kind of social connections with people that are like-minded. Now, in Los Angeles, it's not real easy. It doesn't happen real often. I've made a lot of friends in my local area. I, uh, I'm in a running group here in downtown Los Angeles, uh, and I meet really kind, wonderful people. But politically, uh, they would look at me as the nut job, always. And I guess I'm comfortable with that. But sometimes it's really nice to just say, <laughs> make a joke about the Federal Reserve or inflation or the warfare state or something like that, especially when Horton's around. And everybody gets it. You don't have to explain it or get looked at weird because you're opposing the military empire and its funding mechanisms. So thanks for mentioning that, Matthew. So back on track, we're talking about... Um, we're talking about the funding of government. And when Republicans are in charge, you know, voting voting out the bums to get Democrats out and Republicans in isn't working when it comes to funding. And I think we're all on a collision course. And this is I got this from a, another title of an article that we're going to cover today. We are on a collision course with math. Math doesn't lie. Two plus two is always equal four. It does. It never equals five. And sooner or later, things that can't go on forever don't. So when they continue racking up deficit and debt and uh, more and more larger and larger budgets, they're not going to be able to do it forever. 
They can't inflate their way to freedom. They can't inflate their way out of this crisis again and again and again. And sooner or later, it's going to come tumbling down. So let's talk about some of the articles that we're covering today. First of all, this report, I'm going back. If you're on YouTube, I'm going back to all kinds of stuff. Twitter, Peter Schiff. Okay, so here at our blog at 10thamendmentcenter.com, yesterday we published an article from Mike Meharry. Mike is an incredible writer. He uh, was a professional journalist for many years before he started volunteering and now works with the 10th Amendment Center for a long time. Uh, he's our national communications director. He uh, writes legislation. He writes books, all kinds of really awesome stuff. He also started working for Peter Schiff at SchiffGold.com quite a while ago, and he is really an expert when it comes to general economic issues, coming from an Austrian perspective, of course. And here's the report. U.S. government expects to borrow another $425 billion in Q4 2018. Mike puts it this way. The Republican Party of Fiscal Responsibility, and mind you, that is in quotes, Party of Fiscal Responsibility, continues to rack up debt at a staggering rate. The U.S. Treasury plans to borrow another $425 billion in the final quarter of 2018, bringing total borrowing for the year to $1.3 trillion, according to a Treasury Department press release. If I was running the Treasury Department, man, I don't know if I'd want to make that uh, a real popular thing, a well-known thing, but I guess they got to put this information out. Now, when it's all said and done, Mike writes, the level of borrowing in 2018 will more than double the debt run up in 2017. Huge. According to the Treasury Department, it will continue the torrid borrowing pace in the first quarter of 2019 as well. So it isn't just a stopgap, as we always hear. Well, they got to get this bill passed. They got to borrow more. They got to spend more. It just to get the military funded, or we got to keep Social Security and Medicare going. We don't want to leave our seniors out high and dry. No, they just use that as an excuse so people feel bad or people who are afraid uh, that having the having anything less than a military that is funded at the same rate or greater than the next 10 largest combined in the world is somehow uh, w w cutting back on the military. So this is all garbage, or that seniors are going to die in the street if they cut funding. I mean, certainly you don't want to people who have developed a dependency on government. I think there has to be a way of weaning people off. Maybe the point would be uh, younger people stop participating in the thing. But uh, I think that's another question for another day. So according to the Treasury Department, it's going to continue the toward borrowing pace in the first quarter of 2019. The department projects it will borrow even more another $356 billion. So a little bit less than this quarter, but uh, definitely more and more and more. So they, uh, supposedly we're, we've got this amazing economy. We're told over and over the economy is incredible, the economy is great, uh, when uh, that, in, th that any problems facing the economy are caused by the Federal Reserve, which technically is correct, Keeping interest rates artificially low, inflating the currency, causing malinvestment. So if if the market says interest rates should be 6%, 5%, 3%, 10%, whatever it may be, if the normal market would be 10%, I probably wouldn't take out uh, a new credit card and start racking up debt on it. I don't think most people would. Or 15%, whatever it may be. But when the Federal Reserve creates a climate where borrowing money becomes 0%, it's very likely people are encouraged to take out more debt. And when debt is easy to take on, it's easy to buy more stuff. So that drives the production of more stuff as long as the debt is easy to get, as long as the credit is easy to take on. As long as you can take on more and more debt, it's easier to buy more garbage. I was thinking about getting a, an interest-free television a while back. I decided just to use my phone. But, uh, you know, I I feel it myself. In my, even knowing this, I feel it in my day-to-day -day life. Like, oh, wow, that would be pretty easy to pay over 18 months or 24 months or 12 months, whatever it may be. And if you add this up person after person after person, a lot of people are taking out much more they, than they can afford. So eventually, these variable interest rate loans that we're basically getting, when they go up, as the Federal Reserve has to raise the rate, 
a lot of people start defaulting. And as a default, cause it causes kind of a domino effect. So uh, Mike goes on and he says, although the economy is supposedly enjoying a boom, U.S. government borrowing looks more like we're in the midst of a deep recession. Long term U.S. debt sales have risen to a level not seen since the height of the financial crisis. So if things are as bad as they were at the height of the 2008 financial crisis, then what does that tell you? It, could it be as bad as then, if not worse? Mike continues. He says, currently, the biggest buyers of U.S. debt aren't in a buying mood. So if people aren't buying that debt, basically funding it, buying more, more bonds on the marketplace, if no one wants to take that on because they're all loaded up as well, Japan, China, elsewhere, if they don't want to buy more and more of this debt, sooner or later, you can't create more debt. So we're really putting the fate of our economy in the hands of of foreign countries or foreign interests who want to basically prop up the economy. And that is not a smart move at all. Basically, the only way forward, the only way out of it is going to be a very painful one. Allow interest rates to go to their natural level, get rid of the Federal Reserve, and stop spending more than they take in. No one's willing to do that in Washington, D.C. So if you're thinking about who to vote for uh, next week, Tuesday, and if you've got a choice between someone who's willing to fund Obamacare and someone who's willing to fund Obamacare, basically the Senate race in Texas, what's your choice? Then people go to focusing primarily on social issues uh, like race, religion, and things like that. And they're just totally distracted from what's facing us, this economic crisis. We're drowning in this debt that's facing us, the violations of the Constitution, attacks on our liberty. They're just focused on these other issues because when uh, option A and option B are virtually identical in attacking the Constitution, sometimes they may have a different approach on different issues, but when they're both identical in being awful, then, of course, you're going to choose something else. Now, me, I don't choose either of these people. Uh, if I were in Texas, I'm not voting for either one. I'm not voting for the lesser of two evils. I'm not voting for funding Obamacare, no matter what. Why would I choose that? I never even paid the Obamacare tax. I never paid the mandate. I did not get the health insurance. I did not pay it. It probably puts me at risk of getting some kind of fine down the road. Uh, they can't collect it. The IRS itself actually says on their website that they don't have a mechanism to collect the mandate, the penalty. So if you don't pay it, they probably just have a line item for me that's collecting interest. But I feel like for me, now this may not be the right choice for someone else. For me, this was a principled stand that I wanted to take. So there's no way that I'm going to actually vote for someone who's willing to fund that monstrosity. No way. So if they're not willing to buy, we're in a lot of trouble. So here's an interesting quote from an article in Fee, Foundation for Economic Education. It's one of my daily reads. Chris Edwards, we're going to go to one other quick article over at Fee in a moment. And Mike quotes it. Uh, they, Chris Edwards says, They dream about spending on their favorite program and act as if there won't be harsh consequences to their profligacy. Profligacy. Man. <laughs> When you don't know how to say something, you learned it from reading, I guess. Uh, but there will be. Future living standards are being eroded as huge costs are being pushed forward, and the rising debt will eventually spark a damaging financial and economic crisis. Dangerous stuff that we're facing here, and dangerous stuff with a conservative-controlled Congress. Or people will say, well, it's not true conservatives. Well, if, you, if you've if you got the, the Republican president and a majority of Republicans in Washington, D.C., in Congress and in the state capitals, and it still keeps getting worse. I mean, you're not selling me very well on this whole vote for the lesser of two evils thing. I am not convinced. So here's the great article that I found over at uh, Foundation for Economic Education. It was last week, Thursday, from Brenton Smith. When will politicians admit Social Security, which is a socialist program, which is unconstitutional, is on a collision course with math. And I think we're the entire economy is on a collision course with math. Brenton says, The Social Security Administration believes that about half of those turning 71 today will outlive the system's ability to pay its bills in full. That fact should draw the attention of seniors everywhere, but no one is talking about this. And as I mentioned just briefly a few minutes ago, people are focused on all these uh, divisions, these 
divisions of about people physically and their personal choices, their religion, their race, and things like that. And they're focused so heavily on that. Uh, and I think the establishment on both the left and the right, they love this because as long as we're fighting about our skin color amongst each other, as long as everyone's fighting about that and recognizing that what's on the inside, the the blood runs blue on the inside or red uh, on the outside, and we ignore that and we're fighting about this other garbage, we're all ignoring the fact that they're both spending us into oblivion. They're both... Uh, I mean, they're both taking our right to keep and bear arms. They're both attacking it. They're both uh, approving extensions of the Patriot Act to expand NSA spying. They're both funding the military empire where the U.S. military is in over 170 locations around the world. So as long as we keep fighting amongst each other, they keep getting more and more power for themselves. And Brenton points out that basically no one is talking about this. I will post a link to this because I, you don't need me telling the whole story here today. But basically he's talking about the Florida election where there's tons of seniors. Florida is known as being a senior place. Arizona, too, but really Florida. And there's this election in Florida and almost no one is talking about Social Security. As even though the Social Security Administration itself is saying that people over 71 really aren't going to get any more benefits. They're going to outlive the benefits. There's not enough money. Brenton goes on. He says, in 2016, President Trump promised not to touch Social Security and was awarded the highest office in the nation. And he has kept, kept his promise. Since he arrived in office, the program has reported a roughly $2 trillion increase in unfunded liabilities. That is more than the program has collected in revenue. In other words, Congress could have reduced benefits to zero and the program would still be in worse shape today than when he arrived. And he goes on. Uh, in 2017, the actuaries forecast that the program would generate enough internal revenue to fulfill its obligations until 2022, but that five-year buffer evaporated in a court over a course of a year. The whole system is on. I mean, this article says Social Security is on a collision course with math. Medicare is on a collision course with math as well. The military empire is on a collision course with math. They can't continue funding this. Foreign aid propping up dictators around the world is on a collision course with math. So is the spending and the debt. This They just cannot continue this forever. And I know they're going to try to inflate their way out of this. And Peter Schiff, our quote of the day, he points, this, uh, points out, and I think this is a really good one. Uh, yesterday, he was watching CNBC. I don't know how he can stomach it. I guess it gives him good things to talk about on Twitter. But Schiff says, Rick Santelli just had a good rant on CNBC with one huge mistake. He said that we finally have decent fiscal policy under Trump. By what definition, Peter asks, is slashing taxes and increasing spending decent? It's obscene. We had bad fiscal policy under Obama but it's worse under Trump. I like cutting taxes. I want to see taxes cut to zero. Taxation is theft. They're ripping us off at every single turn. But they're kicking the can down the road. Cutting taxes may be easier than cutting spending. But if they don't cut that spending, we are on a collision course with math, and they cannot continue this forever. Oh, hi to Idamon over in the live chat and Woodsider. Woodsider quoting Chevy Chase as Gerald Ford. It was my understanding that there would be no math. I appreciate everybody for watching. I hope you found something interesting. It's not great news. I never give awesome news. Eventually, I'm going to start doing that when we get into nullification season, uh, January, December, January through April or so, or so. You will see some good news. Our State of the Nullification Movement report over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report does provide some good news where people on a state, local, and even individual level are taking action to advance liberty without permission from the federal government. That's very positive. So I apologize for the negative news. It is factual. We don't want to hide from facts. We don't want to hide from math. And uh, I hope everyone found something interesting today. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. We'll be back here on Friday. And of course, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Thank you so much and have a great day.